There's the assumption that doing anything good for the environment or for anything, anyone other than yourself, there's the assumption that that's going to require a sacrifice of some kind. Well, what the Earthship does is basically engineer that sustainability and that ecology into the design of the building itself so that you live your life normally and you know the systems are integrated to provide for you what you need without you having to make a sacrifice so it's kind of through engineering instead of through lifestyle adjustment <laughs> He's, this, this one's a creative horse his name's happy they don't respond really well to names but they respond really well to cookies and cookies i guess we're gonna walk up to your earth ship let's do it <laughs> So you went out to Taos, where they build the majority of them? The architect Michael Reynolds, who, who's coined the term Earthship and founded the company out there, he's been building experimental houses for since the late 60s, early 70s. I went out there and, and did a seminar with them. After that, started interning with the company and eventually did their academy session, which is a mix of classroom and hands-on. So I worked on a few buildings start to finish alongside the crew before I came and started building this one here. Why'd you choose this direction? It's facing south for maximum sun exposure. So the sun moves, you know, rises in the east, sets in the west, and moves across the southern sky. In the winter time, it appears low across the, you know, closer to the horizon, so it shines through the glass face to help warm the building. In the summertime, it passes more directly overhead. So the green, the slope glass on the greenhouse lets light into the greenhouse, but shades the living space from direct sunlight. So this wasn't an afterthought? No, no, it's the absolute most necessary first step is orientation of the building. All of the systems are kind of integrated with one another, and they all kind of rely on that southern orientation. Tell me a little bit about what's going on out here in the yard. Yeah, here's my solar panel array. This is what powers the building here. So give me an idea of something I could run with that. Uh, I mostly just use it for lights, which in this case I use all LED lights. Uh, charging electronics, laptop, you know, I've, I've run audio equipment and everything off of it. Some of the larger Earth shifts will have much bigger systems that you can run all kinds of household amenities, washer and dryer. and. You know. The, the walls and everything are all basically this, their tires filled up. So yeah, once you get your level site in the beginning, you kind of lay out the building with string, and then you lay the cor first course of tires out where the wall's gonna go, and fill it full of dirt, and just kind of pack it in with a sledgehammer. In this case, the dirt's kind of frozen, so it's gonna take a little bit of work in, but. When a tire is complete, it'll be firm all the way around and weigh two to 300 pounds, it's basically an indestructible brick. I like it. And it's, uh, it's earthquake resilient, it's uh, long lasting, it's flame proof, uh, it exceeds the compressive strength of concrete actually. It's a thermal mass wall, so it's a conductive storage of thermal energy, which is the basis for that, how the home heats and cools itself. Yeah. So the used tire shops when well, for one thing, the used tire shops are great because they're generally putting used tires on cars. So the tires that they're taking off are like, you know, have holes in them or they're, you know, starting to come apart. They're completely useless for the road. Yeah. And they actually have to pay $2 average per tire to properly dispose of them. So if you come in and say, hey, I need your tires, yeah, they're eager to get rid of them and not have to pay. They're saving money and you're getting free building material. Yeah, so the greenhouse serves as basically a collection of sunlight, which, as I explained, helps heat and cool the building, but it also is a place to grow food and treat your gray water and recycle it. So these trenches that you see here are gonna be lined with a rubber pond liner and then filled in with layers of rock and then sand and soil on top. Uh, so once it's all finished, this will just look like a mulch garden floor with stepping stones. You won't see these trenches, but they'll be constructed to allow water to circulate through. So when the sun is coming in, in the summertime, we'll release this rope and allow this ventilation box to open. And because this is the highest point in the building, that hot air will escape and rise through there, uh, which creates a, a current that pulls air through the north side of the building that lets cool, fresh air in from outside. Thank you. 
In this case, all these bottles are just going to be covered up with plaster. You know, this will be a smooth, paintable wall. Tell me, why cans, why bottles? Uh, they're abundant materials, they're free. One advantage to the use of recycled materials in the Earthship application versus other means of recycling uh, is that it saves a lot of embodied energy that goes into typical recycling. First of all, you have to gather it all, you have to put it on a truck, you have to transport it, you have to put it in a facility that's usually an energy intensive process to break it down and reconstruct it into another product. Uh, in this case, you're just, you can use it right where it is without transforming it. Same with the tires, the bottles and cans. You just, uh, you can pick them up locally and, and put them right into the wall without transforming them into something. Basically, the, the purpose of the cans and bottles is really just uh, to displace concrete so that you can form up a wall using less material. So the structure is just in the honeycomb matrix of cement in between the bottles, and the bottles and cans are just filling up space. And these are going to last a long time, you say? Concrete is, uh, is an extremely long-lasting material. In fact, we use basalt fiber in here to give it the tensile strength, so it is not steel, uh, and basalt doesn't expand or contract or rust or corrode or anything like that, so this wall could last thousands of years. We might even have a better housing technology by then, but we could solve a lot of the world's problems just through simply the engineering of building design, you know, from energy demands and housing demands and water shortages and all of these different kind of struggles that we face as a planet and as a species. Um, this really kind of addresses them all in a really simple way, you know. I think if people could experience these buildings firsthand, see how they work, see how kind of unique and interesting looking they are beyond just uh, functionality, I think that most people would volunteer to live in one if they had the means of making it possible. But with building codes as restrictive as they are and these techniques being so uh, new and unusual, uh, it's hard to get financing, it's hard to get permits, it's hard to just make it happen, not to mention to drop what you're doing and get out of your lease or your mortgage and consolidate all of your funds to try and pull something like this off. So your main goal now is to strike people's imaginations and just get people thinking and talking. Exactly.